Brown Studio 2014. This is Pastor Mike Harger coming to you with another Watchman video broadcast. We're dealing with the secret of the seal once again. Remember, the symbols that are on the back of the $1 bill that a Freemason, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and uh, his Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace, when Wallace saw the reverse of the Great Seal, he looked at that and he said, stop right here. We've got to put this on the dollar bill. So he brought it to FDR. FDR decided to, I think Wallace had the eagle here and the pyramid here. And for some reason, Roosevelt wanted the pyramid here and the eagle here. And that's how we have it today. We were looking at last week, we were looking at the symbolism of the eagle itself. What does that mean? Uh, we looked in some of these manuals over here. Got a couple things from Manly Hall that we're going to look at today concerning what this eagle really is and what it represents. But we're going to start out going back to the scriptures, picking up where we left off the last time. If you remember from the book of Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 4, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And remember what Lucifer says in Isaiah 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. The image of the eagle is that of an eagle on the wing, rising, ascending, moving upward. If you remember the Apollo 11 patch that the astronauts wore when we first landed on the moon, if you're so inclined to believe it, I am, some people don't, who cares? The symbolism of it. Apollo 11, what number, what, what meaning does that number have? We're going to go to Genesis 11 here in a minute. But the idea that man ascends up to the heavens and builds a nest among the stars. That's what the, um, that's what the capsule was that landed. The eagle, this is what they said. Tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. The eagle was building a nest among the stars. A nest is where you sleep and play. And <laughs> that's what the astronauts did when they landed on the moon. So here it is, God writing about this. Though thou exalt thyself as, as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, God always says, if, you, if man tries to exalt himself, I'm going to kick him back down. Uh, in Genesis chapter 11, the whole idea, and this is what I think the connection between Apollo 11, this number, and this particular lunar mission. If you want more information on this, we did a video called The Babel Conspiracy. We have a book about it as well. You can call our office and we'll get you a copy of that. Um, Genesis 11, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So the whole idea was building something from earth to heaven that man would rise up and that man would ascend. And that's what this eagle represents. It represents the ascension of man by his own will, by his own labor. We will do it even though we say in God we trust. I don't think so. This is all about the efforts of man rising up to a higher level. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 14. Let's, let's look at this passage concerning Lucifer again, because remember, um, who was it? George Bush, the first, the first George Bush, um, initiated a campaign during his presidency called A Thousand Points of Light. And he was giving out these awards and different things like that to these people that were doing good deeds in the neighborhood. Things where people were shining for students and firemen and things like that. The whole idea of a thousand points of light had to do with the idea that man has this inner light on the inside. He is a light bearer. The word for that is Lucifer. Now, we can't, George Bush can't go out and say, hey, I'm going to give everybody the Lucifer Award this week. Who's going, to, who's going to take that? But that's what the idea is. So let's go back to Isaiah 14. Let's think of this idea of Lucifer 
being not only the devil himself, that's his name, he is transformed into an angel of light. Paul talked about that, and he talked about the transformation of his ministers as well. So let's go back to Isaiah 14 and look at the idea that Lucifer not only applies to the devil, but man, as he attempts to ascend like the eagle up into the heights. Isaiah 14, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's man's goal. Stop right here. Remember what Lucifer, the, the dragon, the serpent, told Eve in the Garden of Eden. Ye shall be as gods. It's man's ascension. So I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the side to the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Go back and look at that. See that branch there? Thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Think of, when you think of the symbolism of what this branch is, think of Christ. In Isaiah, this is interesting, Isaiah chapter 11, we have a prophecy of Jesus Christ, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, shall grow out of his roots. That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was of the stem of Jesse. He is the branch. Here is an abominable branch. So this is not Christ. This is Antichrist. Go back and look at this picture. The eagle taking the branch from a low place, setting it in a high place. The ascension, I want you to get this image. The ascension of man, the ascension of the Antichrist coming out of the flames of the pit and being exalted, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is, this is what this symbol means, the idea of the eagle on the wing and rising. Back a few months ago, we were doing a series, and I kind of let up on it for a while. I'm going to join back on that a little bit later. We were dealing, doing a series on the fourth kingdom. We were taking that from Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, the fourth beast. We went to Ephesians chapter 6, principalities, powers, Rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. When we dealt with the idea of principalities, you can go back and watch these particular videos. When we deal with principalities, we were looking at the idea that angels, in some cases, evil angels, although not all, angels, God had given angels sort of a, a principal overseeing of the affairs of men. The book of Daniel refers to Michael being the chief prince of the people of Israel. It is Michael who rules over and watches over the affairs of all of the Jewish people all throughout history. He is their protector. He is um, sort of their ministering angel. There is also the opposite of that, because Michael encountered the prince of the people of Persia. This was a principality. This was a devil spirit. So, in looking at these principalities, we saw from the scripture that any time you have the symbolism of something with wings, and we're going to show you that from the scripture, something with wings, something that is higher than mankind, that shows dominion. This eagle represents a spirit that is now and has been working through our country. Let's look at it from the perspective of American history going all the way back to when the early settlers started coming over here. When they started coming over here, they were looking for freedom. What kind of freedom? Religious freedom. They were looking to be free from the Church of England and the Church of Rome. So they came over with first the Geneva Bible, then the King James. They came over here and they said, doesn't look like anybody here is going to tell us how to worship. Let's just believe what the Bible says. And that was the beginnings 
of the towns and the cities and the villages and the schools and the universities and the colonies of what later became the United States of America. The whole goal was to come over here, preach the gospel, and try to lead people to Jesus Christ. That was the beginning of our nation. But every time you see God work, you also see, like Jube said, certain, certain men creeping in. And from the years of 1620, 100 years later, 1720, all the way up to 1750, 1760, 1770, and then 1776, you see different undercurrents of ideas, Rosicrucian ideas, Masonic ideas, Illuminati ideas, moving in and creeping into the framework of this new nation. So, you have what, what started out as a Christian nation and what appeared to be all, as a Christian nation for the most part, most of the people were, you had an undercurrent of a spirit working through children of disobedience, children like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, who were not Bible-believing Christians. But you had that spirit working through them, and that spirit was a winged beast spirit, a principality, an angel, an evil angel, an evil angel with a very important last day's purpose. Let's go to the scriptures and see that purpose. Deuteronomy 28, 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young, and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee neither corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kine or flocks of thy sheep until he have destroyed thee. I mentioned Freemasonry because here's something that's just really interesting. Whenever There's a painting of George Washington presiding over the laying of the cornerstone of the Capitol building in the capital city, Washington, D.C. When they laid this cornerstone, the Masons, Freemasons, George Washington was one of them, when they laid this particular cornerstone, they made an offering to the stone. I'm not kidding you. They, here's the stone, oh, blessed stone, whatever, whatever they say. They made an offering of three things to this stone, corn, wine, and oil. Go back and look at this verse. Because God was saying, Deuteronomy 28, He said, if you keep all, all of my statutes and judgments, then I'll bless your cities. I'll bless your fields. I'll bless your children. I'll bless you. Uh, you'll, have, you'll, you'll loan money and not have to borrow any. Think about that. That is the nation that does what God says. If there is a nation, God said, if you don't do what I said, you don't keep all of my statutes, and nobody does then here's what's going to happen. I'm going to curse your cities. I'm going to curse your fields. You're going to borrow money, not be able to pay it back and not be able to loan it out. That's what you're going to do. And then he said, I'm going to send a nation to you from afar. And I'm going to send them as swift as the eagle flies. And then he said, he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil this nation that flies as swift as an eagle was going to consume corn, wine, and oil, the very same things that Masons offer as, I don't know what, they're, what they think they're doing. I think the spirit of this principality is leading and governing them. But you see the idea that the emblem of this eagle represents a spirit, a principality that now dominates most of what's going on in America and it's a precursor I, I think I think because we have American presidents who put their hand on top of a Bible and swear an oath I think there is a connection between between what's in this Bible and what God's going to do in the last days and I think we are looking at a nation according to Deuteronomy 28 that does not regard the Word of God it doesn't regard the laws and the statutes of God and I think God is going to send 
to this nation, a nation that comes from afar as swift as the eagle flies. It's a nation of fierce countenance. He also said it's a nation whose tongue they wouldn't understand. I want you to look on the back of the dollar bill. I have words here like one, the United States of America, one dollar, and God we trust one, great seal of the United States of America. But then I also have three phrases on here in a language that most people don't understand. We don't speak it. Anuit queptus, novus ordus seclorum, e pluribus unum. I mean, we've kind of learned what those mean. But we don't, we don't speak these languages. Not only that, the language of symbolism that's on here is a language that most people in the world don't understand and never will understand. And I think that that shows the spirit that is behind that nation that is going to come as swift as the eagle flies and take over this world. Jeremiah 4.13, Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. This is not a good nation that's coming. Jeremiah 48, 39. They shall howl, saying, How is it broken down? How hath Moab turned the back with shame? So shall Moab be a derision and a dismay to all them about him. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, he shall fly as an eagle, and shall spread his wings over Moab. Kirioth is taken, and the strongholds are surprised, and the mighty men's hearts in Moab at that day shall be as the heart of a woman in her pangs. Think about that. And Moab shall be destroyed from being a people, because he hath magnified himself against the Lord. Look at it. He said he shall fly as an eagle and shall spread his wings over Moab. I believe that represents a spirit and a fierce nation that is coming, represented by this emblem. That day shall be as the heart of a woman in her pangs. Think about what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. For when they shall say peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. If you've ever been, if you have ever been with a woman who has gone into labor, they go from zero to labor in three seconds. And it's going to come swiftly, just like eagles fly swiftly. The destruction of this world, this emblem, it doesn't represent freedom. It represents a principality that rules over, I believe, this nation and other nations and is leading up to the things, all the things that the Bible talks about happening in the last days. 20, Jeremiah 49, 22, Behold, he shall come up and fly as the eagle and spread his wings over Basra. And at that day shall the heart of the mighty men of Edom be as the heart of a woman in her pangs. There it is again. Lamentations 4, 19. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. Eagles of the heaven is a reference to these spirits that are up on high. And God is going to allow them to come down upon people and judge them in a swift and a fierce matter. Hosea chapter 8 verse 1. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed my law. I'm going to go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said, set the trumpet to thy mouth. Think of God blowing trumpets in the last days. That's what this is connected to. Then he said he shall come as, as an eagle against what? Against the house of the Lord. Here we are in 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let's go all the way back to what we learned in the first part of these videos. We were dealing with the idea of what a seal represents. A seal, we use the term that we're going to seal their fate. I believe the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, seals the fate of those who receive it. And the spirit behind this particular seal is a nation and a king, Daniel chapter 8, I believe, of fierce countenance, whose tongue they shall not understand, 
Think about the sounds that eagles make. Do they speak? Some say they do. Do we understand what they're saying? No. We have no idea what they're saying. The animal kingdom, the beasts of the field, the beasts of the air, they all make their noises. No one understands the language that they speak. But I believe that this represents a spirit that is going to seal the souls of mankind. It is the judgment of Almighty God in the last days. When we look at this eagle, I want you to take a look at it. I want you to notice that we have like right wing, left wing. We have something in one foot and something in the other. We have an olive branch and berries in one. We have arrows in the other. You know what that is? They say that the arrows represent war. The olive branch represents peace. So I want you to kind of think about this for a minute. Here is a creature that has opposites in it. War is not peace, and peace is not war. But this eagle holds them and binds them together and represents both of them. This eagle represents opposites being joined together. Let's take a look at, we're going we're to compare the eagle that's on the the seal of the United States with another winged creature that we have talked about many times. Take a look. This is Baphomet. This is a god of transformation. I want you to notice that he has opposites. He is half man, half woman. He's half man, half beast. He's uh, one hand's pointing up, one hand's pointing down. He's got the pentagram mark on his forehead, and he has eagle's wings. That's what they are. They are the wings of an eagle. And I'm, I am suggesting that this symbol on the great seal of the United States is a representation of something that we have studied for years in the Watchman broadcast and things that I've been looking at from scriptures. Is that the idea that this beast, let me give you scripture. Revelation chapter 13 verse 18. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. You see that? They're opposites. And I think this eagle with the opposites in its two claws represents the spirit of the Antichrist that's going to come in the last days as swift as the eagle flies. And I believe the idea of it with, on the wing and rising represents his ascension out of the bottomless pit. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 14. We're going to get a picture of this. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land whether you go over to possess it. Take you therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image. I want you to think about it because in Revelation chapter 13, what does the false prophet cause them to do? build an image or make an image to the beast. He said, lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, you see that? The likeness of any beast that is on the earth and the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. God said, don't, no, don't do that. Don't make an image of these creatures. You'll worship them. They are principalities. They are little g gods. And God says, I don't want you learning. We've already found out that when it comes to these seals and these beasts and these creatures on these seals, it goes all the way back to Babylon, Canaan, um, the old nations that were in existence, even in Egypt. They all worshiped these winged creatures as gods. And God said, don't learn that religion from them and don't worship these, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. In Ezekiel chapter 17, I want you to notice he's going to show you the emblem of an eagle and then he's going to tell you what it represents. So we find out the answers right from the pages of the King James Bible. Look at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings. Take a look at that seal again. 
long-winged, full of feathers, which had divers' colors come unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. Then look at verse 11. He's going to give you the understanding of what this eagle represents. Get ready. Verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon. Let me illustrate Babylon for a minute. Babylon is in a plain. It's in a low area. That's the opposite of Jerusalem, which is above is in a high area. You see the opposites? One's not the other. Both Babylon and Jerusalem are figured as mothers. Paul said in Galatians that Jerusalem, which is above is free, is the mother of us all. John said that Mystery Babylon is the mother of harlots. So you see the contrast here. So let's do this. Here we have heaven. Here we have hell. And the Antichrist who is pictured as an eagle is none other than the king of the city that's in the really, really, really low place. I'm trying to get to this verse as quick as I can. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. We have a video called The Beast of 9-11. Go watch it. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Whose, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Both of them mean destroyer. Isn't that, isn't that neat? Here we have this eagle. He's a symbol of a god. He's a symbol of a king. He's a symbol of something ascending up into the heavens, above the heights of the clouds. The Bible lets you know that he represents the king of Babylon, which basically is the king of hell the king of the bottomless pit, Apollyon, and Abaddon. Daniel chapter 4, verse 33. This is where it gets really neat. Because when God said the king of Babylon is kind of like an eagle, he meant exactly what he said. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar? He was the king of Babylon. Do you remember what God did with him? How God messed him up, and God messed him up. King of Babylon standing out there looking over the gardens and looking at his kingdom, and he said, that's mine. I built that. Applause, applause. Look at me. Look what I have done. You know what he was doing? He was exalting himself. So God gave him a vision, and in that vision, he saw the watchers and the holy ones come down and tell him, hey, watch what I do. There's, you see this big tree here? I'm going to cut her down. And that tree represented the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar himself. And if you know the story, I actually did a term paper on this when I was in high school. Took a psychology course. The teacher wanted to know, uh, want us to write on somebody famous in, the, in history that had a mental disorder. And I went, I got this one. I didn't know at the time that that teacher was an atheist and a lesbian. Oh, boy, she didn't like my report. She couldn't give me an F on it. She didn't like it. Didn't know. I didn't know. Anyway, Nebuchadnezzar, for seven years, his head was all messed up. He was out in the backyard eating grass, probably like with no clothes on. And I want you to notice how the King James Bible refers to the condition of Nebuchadnezzar during those seven years. His hair, well, let's look at it. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men. He did eat grass as oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. The king of Babylon became like an eagle. And then it goes one step more than that. God not only changed his outward appearance, 
God changed his inward appearance as well. And I think that this is a prophecy of what God's going to do in the last days with mankind who tries to exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Let's look at what God does or what God did to Nebuchadnezzar for seven times, probably seven years. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over him. So I think that this represents a spirit it represents a God, it represents a dominion, a principality over the affairs of America because practically everything that the American government does, what do they do? They put their seal on it. This is, this is us. This is who we are. The president stands in front of the podium. What does he have? He's got the eagle there on it. This is the spirit that is working through the children of disobedience. But I also think the idea of the eagle on the wing rising, I keep saying that because I'm getting to a place here. The eagle on the wing rising represents the rise, the ascension, and the reign of the beast of the last days, pictured as an eagle, the king of Babylon. Now, there is a theory out there, and when I look at it, I'm going... Well, it looks like an eagle. It looks like a scrawny eagle, but it looks like an eagle. There's a theory out there that says that originally, and even now, this bird is not an eagle. It's another type of bird. Not an ostrich, not an emu, not a partridge in a pear tree, but a phoenix. Now, I look at it and I'm going, well, I don't... I don't necessarily see that, but there are some clues here that I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to bring in some things that we saw earlier from the earlier seals. If this actually isn't, in fact, a phoenix, it sure was intended to be by some very important people. Let's look at it. This is what Manley Hall said in Secret Teachings of All Ages. He said both Herodotus and Pliny noted the general resemblance in shape between the phoenix and the eagle, a point which the reader should carefully consider, for it is reasonably certain that the modern Masonic eagle was originally a phoenix. What is he talking about? This one. The one that's on the front of Morals and Dogma, Manley Hall, who I mean, this guy knew everything about just about every religion in the world. He had spent his life studying the mystery concepts and the mystery symbols. And he was pretty good. His problem was he didn't believe the Bible. He didn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't believe in the one true Savior, Jesus. He believed that there was a secret that was being kept hidden by all the Masons and the Rosicrucians and the, and the Mithraic rites and all this stuff that was actually better for man than anything else in the world. He died lost. That's what he did. But he had a suggestion that the eagle that adorns the front of, of uh, morals and dogma was actually not just an eagle, but a phoenix. What is a phoenix, you say? We're going to look at that. We're going to see, we're going to look at some of the evidence of whether or not this eagle actually represents the phoenix and what it represents. Hall goes on to say, at the back of its head, the phoenix had a peculiar tuft of feathers, a fact quite evident, although it has been overlooked by most writers and symbolists. Here's what he's talking about. Here is the emblem. This is from an old book. This is the emblem of the phoenix bird. The phoenix, as you probably know, it rises, it, it dives into the fire, burns itself up, and then is resurrected from the ashes of its own flames um, and takes its place among the, the heavenly lofties or whatever. Anyway, it's got this tuft of feathers on the back of its head. And Hall was saying, you see this eagle here on this dollar bill and the great seal? It's got the faintest hint of a little tuft of feathers back there. Now, Manley Hall said something interesting, and I haven't pursued this 
um, this avenue in this particular teaching, but Hall said that that tuft of feathers on the back of the phoenix's head actually represented the third eye, the pineal gland. And if you look at this picture again, see the radiant light coming out of that? Anytime you see that in emblems or emblemology, symbology, you're looking at illumination, something where the light has been turned on. And notice that it's the head and the tuft of feathers of this particular phoenix. Now, even though I look at this and I'm going, okay, it kind of looks like a scrawny chicken eagle. I don't think that I see a phoenix here. I have to go back and look at, remember, we kind of went through the history of how we got our great seal and the thoughts that were behind it. I don't know if you remember this or not, but the second version of the great seal of the United States, let me show it to you. See Lady Liberty there holding a dove and the, uh, the great patriot. You have an eagle up at top holding a key and a flag, but inside the shield, is a phoenix rising up out of the flame. So here's the idea. The question is, did the original founders of our nation, being led by some sort of spirit, like an eagle, were they influenced by the symbolism of the phoenix? The answer is absolutely, it's right there. And we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna understand a little bit more about what they saw America and the future of America as being via Francis Bacon, um, but we're going to look at this idea that this eagle could very well represent the phoenix, and what is the phoenix? We're going to get the clues here. Here's what Manley Hall said, Secret Teachings of All Ages. Medieval Hermetists regard the phoenix as a symbol of the accomplishment of alchemical transmutation a process equivalent to human regeneration. Let me stop right here. All of this talk means alchemical transmutation, human regeneration. See the word gene in the word regeneration? We're gonna redo the genes. We're going to resurrect man from his lower dead self and he is going to ascend into a higher life form. Go study transhumanism. Go read the news every day and spot how many articles now are coming out dealing with the idea that scientists are just like on the verge of being able to transform all of humanity by changing his genes, by re-gening him. And the phoenix was the symbol of al alchemy is all about turning mortals into immortals, humans into gods, hence Genesis chapter 3. The phoenix is the alchemical symbol of transforming uh, humans into gods. That's what it's the symbol of. The name phoenix was also given to one of the secret alchemical formula. The familiar pelican of the Rose Croix degree, feeding its young from its own breast, is in reality a phoenix a fact which can be confirmed by an examination of the head of the bird. The ungainly lower part of the pelican's beak is entirely missing, the head of the phoenix being far more like that of an eagle than of a pelican. In the mysteries, it was customary to refer to initiates as phoenixes or men who had been born again. Stop right here. Here we go. Men who had been born again. Jesus was sitting there with Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Masons love that verse. And he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Did you know that phrase is found exactly three times in the King James Bible? Here's the third one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And here is Manly Hall talking about these initiates into the mystery religions, like masonry, were called phoenixes, or men who had been born again. But born again from what? Not the pure words of the Word of God, but the mystery, the lost word. That's what they're born again by. That's what the phoenix represents. 
For just as physical birth gives man consciousness in the physical world, so the neophyte, after nine degrees in the womb of the mysteries, was born into a consciousness of the spiritual world. Now, do you remember the London 2012 Olympic closing ceremony? Do you remember that? I'm watching this, and I'm looking at all these people coming out with all these little bird costumes that looks like flames, and they're all flying around doing this dance, and then you get this symbolism at the end. Take a look at it. The London 2012 Olympics. You see, do you see an eagle on the wing rising? Do you see the unfinished pyramid with the capstone in the background? Do you see that? This is in London. This is not America. This is London. You know why? The same spirit, the same spirit that the principality that I think controls and governs over the fairs of the United States of America, I think it's the same spirit that works in Great Britain, Russia. We talked about Russia using that same symbol, Germany, the ancient Roman Empire. They all used the same symbol. Why? I think that was the spirit that ruled over them. And here, London 2012, giving homage, giving praise, and worshiping a fiery flying creature rising up out of flames imposing upon the world a new world order. How can you have a new order of the ages unless you destroy in the flames the old world? That's the plan. That's the goal. How can you have a new body without destroying the old one? That's the plan. That's what that eagle, how can man ascend to become a god unless he sheds off his mortality? That comes from 1 Corinthians 15. And god has the plan of eternal life. The devil has a mockery of that plan. And the phoenix is the symbol of that plan. And I think, I, I'm convinced, I had my doubts. I'm going, it doesn't look like a phoenix. I'm convinced that this eagle actually represents the phoenix. The same spirit was there, the same concepts were there of the men who were designing the great seal of the United States of America. We knew that the phoenix was in the back of their mind. London, 2012. Do you remember this one? Do you remember the miners from Chile? Do you remember how many of them there were? 33. If we go look here, you'll see the eagle, phoenix, two heads, fusion of opposites, and there are stars here. There's 33 of them. That represents a third of the angelic realm. And I want you, 33 in Freemasonry, you get it, don't you? Okay? It's the number, it is a number for the beast. In fact, the exact phrase, the beast. Download, go to purebiblesearch.com. Download a free copy of our software. You can search the King James Bible and it'll give you the numbers. Type in the phrase, the beast, look in the New Testament. 33 times exactly. Exactly. 33 times in the New Testament, the phrase, the beast. You have 33 miners. So I want you to understand this. And where are they? They are sealed down in a pit. And they can't get out. So they came up with an ingenious plan to bring the 33 out of the pit. Do you remember what it was? They designed this pod, this capsule, that would be injected down into the pit. And one by one, the 33 would get into that. And they would rise from the pit up to the surface. They called that capsule the phoenix. The symbol is, I'm just looking at this and I'm going, okay, you got 33 in a pit and the phoenix brings them out of the pit into the world. Yeah. I don't think it was an accident. I don't think, I, and you, you say, well, you think all those guys there and they're Illuminati, they think they're all in it. They're all Mason. They gotta be. No, no, no. See, it's actually rather simple. In Ephesians, remember this eagle is running the affairs of this nation bringing us to a new world order, bringing us to a transformation. 
And Paul talked about it. I've quoted this verse several times. Ephesians chapter 2, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. If you're lost, you don't have to be in the Illuminati and you don't have to be a Mason. You don't have to be a Rosicrucian. You don't even have to be anything. If you're lost, there is a spirit that guides the affairs of mankind. I believe that there was a spirit trapping these miners down there. I believe those miners were there on that day for that reason, and the spirit was working on that day, sealing them in, and then a certain time with a certain uh, rescue plan later, the symbolism, they were brought up out of that pit like a phoenix ascending up out of the flames of its own destruction. And then, then, Last week, this guy, girl named Conchita Worst, Mr. Mrs. Worst, he is a European singer. He is a man, supposedly, and when he is on stage, he has the hair of a woman and the face of a man. Stop right here. Let's go to, <laughs> I'll tell you, this Bible is right in everything that it says. You should have been reading this a long time ago. You're going, yeah, I know I should have. Revelation chapter 9, in um, the beast that rises up out of the pit, we have locusts coming up. And it says here in um, verse 7 of Revelation 9, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared into battle, and on their heads was as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had the hair as of women. And take a look at Mr. And Mrs. Worst. He's got the face of a man and the hair of a woman. And he wins the Eurovision singing contest. And I, I haven't listened to the music. I've only, only watched the video without the music playing. And some people wrote in and said, this guy can't sing. But he's being cheered on. He's being worshipped. And he won the prize. And I want you to take a look at this picture. Yep, those are fiery wings behind his, her back. And this is the song that Mr. and Mrs. Worst, Worst, this is the song that he, she sang on that particular day. Rise like a phoenix out of the ashes, seeking rather than vengeance, retribution. You were warned, once I'm transformed, once I'm reborn, you know I will rise like a phoenix, but you're my flame. You think about it. The symbolism of the phoenix has everything to do with the Antichrist, this winged god, this beast, seven heads, ten horns, this angelic creature. He is the angel, the king of the bottomless pit, and he is put there for a reason. And we find little clues in the scriptures about where he is and how God views him. Leviticus chapter 1. Look at what the Bible says concerning how they should... When the Israelites brought in sacrifices, they could bring in lamb or an ox or a goat. But in some cases, they brought in winged creatures. This is what God said to do in Leviticus chapter 1. And the priest shall bring it unto the altar and wring off his head, and burn it on the altar. And the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers. Think about that. Think about the phoenix. And cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes. And he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar, and upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. Even though your King James Bible does not mention any kind of bird or creature called the phoenix, what it does is it gives you, remember what Paul said in Hebrews, he said everything that was in the law is a shadow of heavenly things. So here is a winged creature that was to be burnt in the fire. That is a picture, I believe, of God casting these evil angels into the, the fiery pit, the bottomless pit, the prison, hell. And they're reserved there against the day of judgment. What's God going to do? Um, a star is going to fall from heaven. Revelation chapter 9. 
the pit's going to be open, and smoke as out of a great furnace is going to rise up. And coming out of that smoke are these creatures with the faces of men and the hair of women rising up out of the ashes like a phoenix. And they have as their king the angel of the bottomless pit, Abaddon and Apollyon. Lamentations chapter 3. This, I think this is the lamentation of the Antichrist. Go read it. Lamentations 3.11. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. That's what God did to the sacrifices. He hath made me desolate. He hath been his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people and their song all their day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He, also, he hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. I think this is the lamentation of the beast that's in the pit, and God's covered him with ashes. He broke his teeth. Um, he broke him in pieces. God, the Bible says he cut Rahab in pieces. And the idea is that this beast has been pieced out, but uh, he must be brought back together so he can rise up out of the ashes. Take a look at Malachi chapter 4, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Ashes. Condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Let's put all these verses together. He said, he covered me with ashes. And God said, you're going to tread down the wicked. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. So ashes represent what's covering the wicked. Then he said, Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of that. And he turned them into ashes. Remember in Deuteronomy 32, God said, their rock is not as our rock and their vine is the vine of what? Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of the destruction of God and the judgment of God upon those creatures that went after strange flesh. And he turned them to ashes. And the beast, the phoenix, is going to rise up out of those ashes. And that's what this eagle represents. Remember, let's look at this. This is what the designer of the third version of the seal, the one that you and I have now, this is what he said. The American eagle on the wing and rising. The similarities and the symbolisms, I think, are too vast to ignore. And I think this eagle represents the rise and the ascension of a very, very bad spirit. A spirit that can move as fast as an eagle, a spirit whose tongue we would not understand, and a spirit of fierce countenance. You never see an eagle smiling. And I have talked about this before. Dolphins, everybody loves dolphins. You can play with dolphins, pet dolphins. You can kiss dolphins, why? They got a smile. You know how God made them? God made them nice. God made them to be congenial with mankind, to, to get along with him, to, to actually thrive in the presence of humans. Dolphins just have a smile. We're not afraid of being eaten by dolphins. Alligators? They like me. Godzilla? He doesn't have a smile on his face. He looks mean. All of these creatures that devour flesh, what do they look like? They are creatures of fierce countenance. I think this eagle represents the spirit of the Antichrist rising up in the last days. Now, I, I, I kept talking about the, the, the spirit of America. You have the gospel being preached from 1620 on. You have churches being built and cities being built upon the gospel and upon the word of God. But then you also have certain men creeping in unawares of uh, certain ideas, certain philosophies, certain spirits and principalities 
taking over the affairs of this country. The phrase Novus Ordo Seclorum carries with it the idea, and I've done some research this week on that, and when I get ready to talk about it, we're going to look at some, we're going to find some very, very interesting things. The particular places that whoever put this on there, Anuit Coeptus and Novus Ordo Seclorum, the places that they got these phrases from, I went and looked and I went, oh my, I'm telling they didn't get them out of the Bible. I'm telling you, there is a spirit at work in America. I love my country. I'm very patriotic. I love the land. But the spirit that is working in the children of disobedience in this nation, I see it. So the whole idea of having a new order of the ages, that's literally what Novus Ordo, new order, seclorum, ages, like certain time frames. A new order of the ages, it's understood that in order to have a new one, we've already mentioned this, you've got to get rid of the old one. So think about when they were establishing this nation. They had come over from the ashes of the Revolutionary War, the fight with King George. Uh, people had settled this land from different European nations. They were coming out of the ashes of the old order in Europe, and they were establishing a new order of the ages in the United States of America. One of the things in particular was that France, England, Spain, Germany, Russia, you name it, all of these countries had a monarch. America was going to be different. We're not going to have a king. We're not going to have a monarch ruling over us. And so the idea, I mean, it's, it's, it's an easy idea. When you look at that second seal with that phoenix on there, it was the idea of these people that, that they felt like they were the phoenix rising up out of the ashes of the old world in Europe. That concept was based upon Francis Bacon who, in around the time of the writing of the King James Bible, Francis Bacon wrote a book called The New Atlantis. And what was about? He envisioned a Masonic utopia where this new land across the, between the two pillars uh, was going to be found and it was going to be ruled over by Solomon and it was going to be peace and tranquility and harmony and everybody has plenty to eat and everybody's getting along and it's ruled by a brotherhood. I get it. That was Bacon's New Atlantis. What, was, what is Atlantis? Atlantis was the mythical land of an advanced state or advanced civilization that all of a sudden one day was buried by a large amount of water. I've heard this story before. Let's go read the scriptures. Here is what I think the myth of Atlanta, Atlantis, Atlanta, Atlantis is based on. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. What is he talking about? He's talking about in the days of Noah. Because the world that then was, was out of the water, and then when it was flooded, it was in the water. So whereby the world that then was, perished being overflowed with water. Water. That's God's destruction in the days of Noah. We, in fact, and let's go back now to find out what those days were like. Because Jesus told us in Luke chapter 17, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Here's what, here's what I see here. I think that the days of Noah 
are coming around again. See, when the, when the founders were putting together this new nation, and they were seeing this phoenix rise out of flames, and they had Bacon's ideas of, uh, of a new Atlantis rising up in the last days, and, and this, this brotherhood ruling over all the world in peace and tranquility and harmony, everything like that. I think they thought they were establishing that right then. Just like, more than likely, the early Christian settlers before 1776 coming over from the land of bondage across the sea to a land flowing with milk and honey, they felt like that they were establishing the earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. In the spiritual sense, they were. They were establishing God's rule and authority over the affairs of mankind. But the symbolisms don't just apply to the initial creation of a nation in 1776. I think that they signify the coming birth of a new order of the ages. It's a time that the Bible describes for us in detail in the past. If we understand the world that was before the flood, as being a world governed by a race of supermen, then I believe that if Atlantis rises again, that those days are coming back upon mankind, just like Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. Let's go back. We're going to look at a couple of verses here, and then we're going to be done for today. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown, in the days before the flood. And we know this. When we look at the events surrounding the Israelites going into Canaan land, the twelve spies went into Canaan, and they said, ten of them said, you can't go in there. They're ruled by a race of supermen, the giants, the sons of Anak, men of tall stature. Those cities and those places are ruled over by those men, and we cannot beat them. Joshua and Caleb, the Bible says Caleb had a different spirit in him. He said, oh, yeah, God said so. I believe God's word. God said we can go in there. Why don't we go in there? And you know the rest of that story. But the days prior to the flood was ruled over by a race of mighty men, supermen, giants. They were the hybrid species of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Think of that phrase here, sons of God, daughters of men. Masculine, feminine, heavenly, earthly. Opposites. Let's look at the eagle again. War in one hand, peace in the other. Hardness as, as the arrows, as a man. Softness as the olive branch and the olives, as a woman. One is cruel. One is a blessing. You have the opposites here. And I believe that denotes sons of God and daughters of men. But they are joined together into one body. Just like the two heads of the eagle here on um, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma represents sons of God, daughters of men, the male, the female, the north, the south, the east, the west, uh, light and darkness. They represent the opposites joined together in one body. We don't have a double-headed eagle in America. We just have an eagle that's fusing opposites together in his claws. What does that mean? We go to Daniel chapter 2. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom should be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. 
Think of the blades on the arrows, iron. Think of the softness of olives, clay. Fused together in one body. That's that symbol. That's what it represents. There's a lot more here that we're going to look at. I'm looking at the shield that he bears. He's got 13 stripes going this way. I also found out there's 13 going this way. There's 13 stars here. 13 berries, berries 13 leaves, 13 arrows, 13 rows of stones. E pluribus unum, count the letters, okay? And there's a lot more of that. When we pick this up the next time, we're going to look at the symbolism of the number 13. Not, not just what it means here, what it really means right here. The Bible is the key that unlocks the secret of the seal. And we'll pick this up next time. Hope you're enjoying it. Hope you're learning something. Study the Word of God. God bless you. This is Pastor Mike, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.